Dr. Mary Cole is a plant pathologist, soil microbiologist, the founder of AgPath, and is a friend of her very own Dr. Elaine Ingham. Mary has been working in parallel with Elaine towards a biological approach to managing plant diseases. Dr. Mary Cole calls into question even the concept of a disease as a natural, natural phenomenon, and through management practices that work with fungal biology, as well as the presence of diverse microbial communities, Dr. Mary Cole will show us how pathogenic fungi, plant pathogens, problems of our making, not theirs. Please welcome Dr. Mary Cole. Woman Jaika, welcome from the land of the Bunurong and the Wurundjeri traditional owners in this part of Southern Victoria in Australia. I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all First Nations people who may listen to this discussion. I also acknowledge their continuing connection to the land and waters and thank them for protecting this region and its ecosystems since time immemorial. Finally, I acknowledge that First Nations sovereignty of this land was never ceded. Fungal pathogens, are they of our making? This is a hypothesis I will explore in this lecture and offer a different outcome. What I will show are the great benefits that the fungal kingdom has offered to life on Earth, and that it is humankind who have put certain species of fungi into the problem category. I smiled when I saw the title of this day, The Importance of Having Fun Guys. The first slide set the scene for the arrival of the fungi and the world in which they, they first inhabited and their relationship to other organisms. Fossils with features typical of fungi evolved about 2.4 million years ago. What makes these probably fungi in, in fungal in origin is the presence of chitin in the cell walls. These cannot be plant roots, for example, as we know that the basic construct for plants would be cellulose. They cannot be the kingdom protista. These are eukaryotes, but not plants, animals, or fungi. Protists have cellulose cell walls. Although the dates keep shifting in the light of more knowledge, it's generally accepted that fungi split from animals about 1.538 billion years ago. This was an aquatic world. Plants split from animals about 1.547 billion years ago, so fungi are closer to animals than to plants. The land fungi evolved around 1.3 billion years ago, and you'll see from this slide fungi down in the Proterozoic period down here. Dinosaurs are more recent, they're up here. And humans were barely a speck on the charts of evolution. Land plants evolved about 700 million years ago. Fungi went from water to land by shedding their flagella. Flagella are the tails used for propulsion in the water. We also know that fungal species retained their flagella for different lengths of time and developed a variety of mechanisms for spore dispersal. In this slide, the left hand here uh, shows fruiting structures called sporangium, with motile zoospores swimming from the sporangium. The slide is not a true fungus, but a protist, but the delivery of the motile zoospores is the same. These spores swim until they find a susceptible or appropriate host, and then they insist and begin the next life cycle. While all this was happening in the fungal world, so other life forms evolved to make up the complex web of life above the ground and especially below the ground. Around 100,000 fungal species are described today but it's thought to be less than 3% of the possible fungal population. Think of the land in the first days. No organic matter, 
minerals in the planetary rocks that eventually weathered to become sand, silt, and clay? How did the first trees or ferns anchor themselves? How did they acquire nutrients? Early fungi could have helped pave the way for land plants. Without them to break down the detritus and release nutrition, it would have been difficult for photosynthetic organisms to extract anything from the ground. The mycorrhizal fungi could have attached to the meagre fruit, uh, root structures and helped to anchor them to the land. At the same time, the fungal hyphae could be scavenging for nutrients to pass on to the plants in return for sugars and carbohydrates. The fungal web spreads through the soil, transferring chemical signals, food and water. Could this be the beginning of the symbiotic relationships between fungi and plants? What look like mycorrhizal relationships are seen in fossils around 600 million years of age. Those relationships are still functioning today. So why are we destroying them with synthetic chemistry like superphosphates? Mother Nature does not allow for freeloaders. Everything must have a reason for existence or there is rapid extinction. Microbes have evolved billions of years ago and are still here and working. They must be necessary for healthy life on Earth. Another successful relationship for fungi is with green algae, producing the beautiful lichens we see on the weather side of trees. Lichens evolved around 250 million years ago. They are an indicator of clean air. Polluted regions around the world do not have lichens on their trees. Here is yet another positive evolution involving fungi. Trees established themselves and mycorrhizae became the superhighways in the soil, assisting the communal relationship between the soil microbes and the tree roots. Trees talk to each other as do the soil microbes and between them, they transfer nutrients around the soil environment for the benefit of all. No waste. Elements are delivered as they're needed and never in excess. Today, those of us who are in awe of life in the soil understand the important role fungi play in soil and plant health. Mycorrhizae take different forms and most species of plants, run about 90%, have some form of fungal symbiotic association with mutual benefit to both partners. Exudates are now known to sequester more carbon than the humus alone. These exudates help in improving water holding capacity of the soil. One important exudate is glomelon. This is a glycoprotein produced on hyphae of arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi in the soil and in roots. Dr. Sarah Wright, a scientist with USDA, discovered this glycoprotein in 1996. This glue attached to the mycorrhizal fungal biomass in the soil is thought to, stir, is so, thought to store one third, one third of the world's carbon. This is mycorrhizal fungal mass. All these benefits that keep coming to light, no problems so far. Remember this fact, it's critical to soil health. Root hairs, or plant roots I should say, have a network of mycorrhizal hyphae attached to the root hairs along their length. This is assuming they're growing in a good healthy soil and not in soil with additions of synthetic chemicals. This is the cooperative association between the plant and the fungus to the mutual benefit of both. The presence of good fungal biomass also improves the soil structure and allows for good water penetration. We've said this before. If we talk about fungi generally, then we must consider the bulk of the species that live as saprophytes. By breaking down minerals and organic matter and recycling nutrients into the atmosphere and the ocean, ancient fungi could have played an important part 
in reshaping Earth's geochemistry, creating more hospitable conditions that pave the way for terrestrial plants and animals to eventually emerge and thrive. <clears throat> Unlike plants, fungi do not live on sunshine and air. They do not photosynthesize. They devour tissues alive and dead. With powerful enzymes, they break down and digest plants and animals. Their untapped powers could help our species to survive in our increasingly poisoned, depleted and warming planet. Fungi are nature's great survivors, the most resourceful and successful of life forms. In short, fungi eat death and in doing so create new life. Communities of microbes alter the chemical and physical character of their environment. Each organism has a role and it does that well. Collaboration over geological time has allowed microbes to do things better. Soils are basically a fingerprint of the evolution of Mother Earth. They the activity under the ground is not generally thought about, and yet it is the basis of all life above ground. The population is just too small in dimension to see. Here we see the relationship within the fungal kingdom. Each group has a role in providing nutrients for plants at the same time decomposing dead material to keep nutrients cycling. Among those many species of fungi, a species that cause disease on plants under very specific environmental conditions. In the natural system, outbreaks, if they happen, are checked quickly, because in the diverse vegetation population in nature, access to susceptible plants is limited. In this environment, fungal species have the ability to act as pathogens, but not the opportunity. Like a good crime movie, means and ability, but not the opportunity because of diversity of plant species in the ecosystem. Plants grow using carbon and nitrogen from the atmosphere and oxygen and hydrogen from water. Photosynthesis, nitrogen fixing from the atmosphere, all form part of the web of life. Rocks from the earth supply the rest. Here is the role of soil microbes, including the fungi. Below the ground, everything depends on the diverse populations of microbes recycling material to release plant available nutrients for life above the soil. This is often referred to as mineralization. Soil microbes, such as mycorrhizae, scavenge for phosphorus, which is particularly immobile in the soil and can be depleted around the plant roots. The mycorrhizal fungal biomass increases the soil accessed by the plant to gain, uh, to, to gain phosphorus. These fungi also produce and secrete acid phosphatases and organic acids that help to release phosphorus from organic complexes. Nitrogen can be delivered to plants by mycorrhizal fungi by accessing inorganic sources of ammonium and nitrate in the soil. Up until now, all organisms knew their place in the environment. They lived in harmony. They lived with and within the variations in the climate. But the last blink in evolutionary history comes along, along comes an animal to change the beautiful harmony that was life on Earth. Everything had a place and knew their place and life went on for billions of years. Because of the amazing diversity of organisms, plants and animals, no entity was able to take over or change the established status quo. Humans developed, and I use that that word advisedly, from hunter-gatherers to fixed communities. Early First Nations people from around the world lived with nature. Their footprint was light. As populations grew, so did the need for more food. 
and many animal species have been lost, probably indirectly, if not directly, because of human exploitation. But if we talk about plants, they understood how to use the various plants and the habitats and the seasons from which they came. They worked with the diversity of plants in their environment. But change was to come. At a point in time, people settled into villages and began to work the soil. Food plants were not foraged, but collected and planted in monocultures year after year. We know the fungi have an important role in the soil, we've said this many times. Even with the horse and hand plough, the damage to the fungal population was recoverable during the season because not all the fungal web had been lost or had lost its function, particularly the mycorrhizal fungal population on the plant roots. The picture shows that the hand plough opened the soil but did not do the damage that the mechanical plough does. More land is turned in a day than the hand plough could have done in a year. The microbes from within the soil are laid bare in the sunshine where they cannot survive. The soil quickly becomes dirt again. Remember back to the mycorrhizal slide where one third of the world's carbon is effectively bound to the roots and the hyphae in the mycorrhizal biomass? This intensive cultivation destroys plants' roots, plant roots, destroys the mycorrhizal fungal biomass, releases stored carbon back into the atmosphere, turns soil into dirt. Is this progress? Questionable. The crops planted in this land do need synthetic fertilizers because the microbiology no longer exists. The plant organic matter has been depleted. Plants are given limited elements on which to grow. The diversity of micro elements is no longer available. The plants contain less nutrients. They become themselves food for pathogenic fungi and insects that were never a problem in the past. The manures, sulphur, rock dust, herbal preparations used in the handheld plough days were mostly organic and had a minimal impact on the microbial diversity. In certain seasons, there were outbreaks of disease from fungi and bacteria, but it was not always devastating. Now, these same organisms have access to a huge population of susceptible plants on which to create havoc. This is modern agriculture, not 10 minutes drive from my farm. High synthetic input, high water input, low return to the farmers. Millions of hectares or acres of land around the world drowned in synthetic chemistry with reducing returns and increasing cost of production. The pathogenic fungal species are having ice cream every day. Agronomists and chemical companies are thinking of ever more innovative molecular manipulations to outcompete the fungal pathogens, but they're losing big time. Microbes have adapted over billions of years. They laugh. Those of us who just know that just removing the bulk of synthetic chemistry will improve the situation, we despair. Late in the 19th century, guano was mined as a source of phosphorus. The widespread adoption of chemical fertilizers around that time had become firmly established in the agricultural production. The amazing and almost instant response from those NPK fertilizers made farmers want more. However, most of the early work showing the benefits of synthetic chemistry was carried out on already depleted soil where microbes had been lost from the system. If a soil has been cultivated annually, remained fallow for part of the year, then the microbes will have desiccated from the weather and being turned up into the sun. The fungal biomass that is so important in building soil structure and holding water has been destroyed. Organic matter may be at a minimum. 
the only way now that plants can grow is to be, to be supplied with a synthetic fertilizer. Pre-emergence fungicides and herbicides to kill weeds, post-emergence herbicides and fungicides to kill those that were not killed the first time through. These are seen as necessary to have a, a clean seedbed with no competition from weedy species, a perfect monoculture, monoculture of cropping plants. In the process, all the beneficial fungi and many of the nitrogen fixing root systems of the so-called weeds are also lost from the environment of the seedlings. There are lots of examples from around the world showing the increase in crop pests and diseases when farm soil is degraded over time and then farmers relied on chemical inputs to prop up crop yields. In other words, the farmers were being encouraged to mine their soils. Fungicides, pesticides and more herbicides were required because neither the crops nor the soil had any resilience remaining. Chemical companies were getting very rich and the farmers were becoming poorer. Diverse microbiology on the phyloplane and in the rhizosphere were missing, as was the organic matter, as mentioned earlier. Mother Nature protects all living things through diversity. The forest networks of fungal hyphae are the largest life forms on Earth. A teaspoon of good soil can have a kilometer of fungal hyphae. Some of this is saprophytic, some mycorrhizal. Cultivation breaks and kills the fungal hyphae. Soil structure is lost. I hear agronomists tell farmers and gardeners that their soil needs gypsum to break up the clods and stop runoff. I noticed in an advertising leaflet for a gypsum product that it, inverted commas, will reduce soil erosion by increasing the ability of the soil to soak up water after precipitation and thus reducing runoff. Close inverted commas. Well, hello. Can I offer you, the farmer, a better solution? Do not plough your field. Run a set of tines through and plant into the deep grass sward. Now this may take some getting used to and it may not necessarily be totally appropriate in all situations but it's certainly appropriate in most. Do not add gypsum to break up the clods on your bare land. Do not ever allow bare hand land to form as part of your farming enterprise in the first place. 100% ground cover, 100% of the time. The clods and compaction form because the microbiology has been destroyed. The soil organic matter is so low that there is little food for the fungi and bacteria to exude glues to hold together the particles of sand, silt and clay. The organic matter will be broken down into the elements in plant available forms by the microbes in the soil. The great diversity of microbial life generates suppressive soils where diseased species are kept in check, even in a monoculture environment. When all the water that falls on the soil is absorbed by the organic matter and the fungal biomass. When soil structure results from the glues exuded by bacteria binding sand, silt and clay particles to form microaggregates, where the microaggregates are then bound by exudates from the fungi to form macroaggregates. Now you have soil that does not need gypsum or synthetic chemistry because the microbes are there doing what they're meant to do, make and protect good soil structure. And this is done for free. Microbes don't send accounts. They, break, they work on pride of a, work, a job well done. Plants growing in such a soil that are fertilized with nothing more than masses of organic matter from diverse sources are healthy with high nutrient levels that make them almost immune to insect and disease attack. Microbes convert nitrogen from composting organic matter in the soil back into water-soluble ammonia and nitrates, called mineralization, as mentioned earlier. This is just one of the many ways that plants can access good plant-available nutrients. In a good suppressive soil, 
The rhizosphere is loaded with diverse bacteria and fungi and other organisms, all with a role to protect the plant root against potential and often only opportunistic pathogens. Different mechanisms are involved, such as just straight up competition for space or production of, of protective metabolites. Suppressiveness can be general, but it also is quite specific, can be quite specific, where certain groups of microbes interfere with some stage of the life cycle of a pathogen. This is all part of a diverse soil and healthy plants free from synthetic inputs of nitrogen and phosphorus. We have had success on asparagus farms nearby by adding thermal aerobic compost around three tons per hectare to the soils that in the previous season tested for the high populations of the fungus Fusarium oxysporum and the protist Phytophthora cinnamomai. We did not eliminate the pathogens, but we did reduce their impact such that the crop tonnage off the field was significantly greater than the previous year. Compost was added in place of the usual synthetic fertilizer input. This field had compost for several years with an improvement each year in yield and quality. The 1845-49 potato famine in Ireland was just one example of how a microorganism has changed human history in geologically recent times. Again, monoculture, agriculture. There are many examples of fungi bringing empires to their knees. Monoculture of plants leaving open the opportunity for a fungal species to become a pathogen. A more recent example of the power of microbes over plant breeders was the southern corn leaf blight of the 1970s in America. This single supposedly improved genotype of corn was planted widely across the corn belt. A fungus, Bipolaris, it used to be called Helminthosporium, made us found this new strain of corn irresistible. The disease caused by this organism was always a minor disease, causing losses around 1%. The new and improved strain of corn showed losses of over 12% the very next year, amounting to 710 million bushels of loss. This is about 14 million tons for us. One fungus, one genotype, disaster. Fungi have had a billion years of practice in getting around genetic changes in their plant hosts. Natural selection variation is occurring all the time. Our early ancestors chose seeds from the strongest plants for the next year's crops. Viticulturists chose vines with the sweetest fruit for their propagation. Fertilizers, fungicides, pesticides, herbicides, loss of soil fertility from diverse microbiota. Chemical fertilizers weaken natural biological defenses of a plant. In the soil, one of the most important was the loss of the mycorrhizal complexes. All through this last couple of centuries, as synthetic chemicals came out of factories and farmers were encouraged to use them, there have been dedicated scientists and farmers showing by example that the most long-term sustainable farming outcomes result from soil farming, increasing soil organism and organic matter, encouraging diversity below and above the ground. These farms had little or no disease and had increased cropping with higher nutrient density in the crops. My favorite of all fungal species is Botrytis scenario. This is an organism that can cause problems, gray rot on your strawberries, and tomatoes and grapes because it loves to feed on sugars in ripe fruits. Mother Nature gave Botrytis, among other organisms, the role of rotting the ripe fruits so that the seeds can be released for the next generation. 
This is an absolutely necessary role for the plant species to survive. Grapevines came originally from the Caucasus between the Black and Caspian Seas. And being vines, they grew up into the trees. The berries were high in the canopies. How did the seeds get to earth to germinate? For Botrytis was there to rot the berries, allowing the berries and seeds to drop to the ground. Grapes became one of the earliest crops to be taken around the globe by early civilizations from Mesopotamia, Greece, Rome, up to the Dutch and the English of modern days. We wanted the fruit in perfect condition for making wine. Botrytis became an unwanted pathogen instead of a useful saprophytic fungal species. Look at the natural habitat of the grapevine. This is not practical for industrial grape growing. Around the world, there are thousands of hectares of grapes grown in monoculture. Many vineyards must be pristine in the eyes of the owners because the enterprise often has a tasting room or a restaurant. Visitors like to see a vineyard mown to a bowling green perfection. These vineyards have many grape varieties. Within the varieties, there may be several clones giving some genetic diversity. In some areas, the Vitus viniferous scion may be grafted onto special rootstocks, but there's still Vitus vinifera and not necessarily healthy from my soil health perspective. Look at a good organic or biological or even biodynamic vineyard. In other words, a healthy vineyard. There are plants growing in the vine row and in the mid row that have not been kept in a bowling green lawn. These look positively unkept when compared with the pristine vineyards. But they are much healthier. Little or no fungicides, herbicides, pesticides are used. The soil biota is functioning. This is what I call a happy, healthy vineyard. The soil biota are jumping. The soil is holding good amounts of water. The mycorrhizal fungal population on the roots of the vines and the mixed plants is high. This vineyard has a restaurant and a tasting room. They make their own compost and they use it in the vineyard. Even the chefs take some of the vegetation, um, like broad beans, from the mid-rows before it's put back into the soil as a mulch. Even now, the industry around the world, some winemakers are trying to make a wonderful wine, usually called a noble wine because of its rare and luscious characteristics. Areas like the Saturn in, from Bordeaux in France, where there are heavy morning dews, but the very hot, dry days during the ripening of the vintage, guess what? There's Botrytis. Botrytis spores germinate in the early morning before daylight. They need free water on berry surfaces to attach by means of an apressorium. Next, enzymes penetrate the cuticle and the cell wall, and the fungal hyphae grows into the, into the berry cell. This occurs in many berries in the bunch. But as the day gets hotter, the berry surface dries out and the fungal hyphae is desiccated or killed, leaving a hole in the berry wall. The hole is large enough for water molecules to weep out, but not large enough for the big sugar molecules. This spore germination, attachment, penetration, and leakage of water goes on day after day. The berries gradually shrivel as their water content leaks out. There is a concentration of sugars in the berry and an intensifying of flavors, and they start to look like sultanas. The berries are coated with a gray mold, but they're not rotting, they're desiccating. If you want to enjoy the intense flavors, aromas, and mouthfeel of a good botrytized wine, then try a Hungarian toke. We make awfully good 
noble wines here in Australia as well. Sommeliers often describe noble wine flavor with words like honey and ginger. This is because the noble wines have a higher level of a special aroma compound called phenylacetaldehyde. Some of the mouthfeel comes from the glycerol content generated from the fungal infection. This organism cannot be bad, can it? Why would one then consider Botrytis scenario a pathogen to be got rid of by synthetic fungicides? Not all grape growing regions have the climatic conditions for noble infection. And many areas simp simply end up with rot from the infection. I have worked long enough in the wine industry and with Botrytis scenario to know it is a perfectly manageable fungal species. Good vineyard management and an understanding of the life cycle requirements of this organism means it can be managed without the use of synthetic chemistry. Improve the soil and by doing so, you improve the resilience of the vines, even if they are grown in monoculture. This pathogen is of our making and does not need to be seen as such. The vineyards I deal with have a good cover cropping all across the vineyard. Mixed species in the mid rows, appropriate trees and shrubs around the border of the fields to provide food sources and habitat for beneficial insects. Of course, those beneficials are present only in the vineyard that has removed fungicides and pesticides from their operational program. This does not mean that in a problematic weather pattern in some years, there will not be outbreaks of different diseases caused by the fungal species. What it does mean, however, is that this vineyard will still harvest a good crop where the synthetic chemical vineyards may not. So I state my case again, pathogens are of our making. We know how to minimize any impact from fungal species that have a very real role to play in the ecosystem. Another example of pests in the vineyards in central New South Wales in the 90s, uh, researchers bred and released pred predatory mites to deal with mites that cause serious damage in conventional vineyards. That's, that's those that use synthetic pesticides. A lovely Italian grape grower took the risk and removed miticides from his vineyard program where he had serious problems with spider mite. On a video, he described the outcome. He said in astonishment, when I stopped using miticides, I did not have any spider mite. Why is this so? Well, all the predatory insects came back into the vineyard and dealt with the spider mites. He planted host plants around the vineyard for the predatory mites during the winter leaf fall. He was one happy chappy because miticides are very expensive. None of the fungicides, pesticides, herbicides have been totally successful for more than a few limited years. The microbial world has mutated to accommodate the next poison thrown its way. Other larger insects, birds, arthropods and others, most of which are beneficial, have been lost along the way with indiscriminate use of synthetic pesticides, never to return. My time is nearly up, but I do want to share with you my farm here in southern Victoria in Australia. We've been on this farm for 48 years and have not used synthetic chemistry. We make our own compost and compost tea. Our paddocks receive magnetic rock dust from a local quarry about every five to ten years. We have a problem, inverted commas, with a flat weedy species called cape weed in this area. The paddocks and the farms become yellow and stock can only eat this plant at certain times in the growth cycle. If you have a look outside our boundary here, you see the carpet of yellow? That's our boundary. Here and on this side as well, below. The Department of Agriculture tells the farmers to spray out the Cape Weed with glyphosate. Boom spraying goes on, leaving bare earth all over the paddocks. More weeds, more chemicals. Some farmers now spot spray, which is better than broad 
uh, scale spraying at least. Our farm, as you can see, does not have Cape weed. You can see our boundary fence line there. Our soil is fungal dominated. We have great diversity of plant species in the pasture. We do not have bare patches. We have happy stock who spend most of their day lying down and chewing their cuds because the pasture is very high bricks. That's the sugars. Alan, my husband, is a little naughty, more out of frustration than anything. When he sprays the compost tea, he makes sure a meter or two goes into the neighbor's paddocks. You can see this on the bottom right here. You can see there's no cape weed where he sprayed. Have they noticed in 40 years? No. The bottom left photograph is, is a picture from the fence looking from um, into our paddocks, from the neighbor's paddocks. You can see our Angus stock. He grows cape weed. We grow grass, but they've not asked why the difference in the vegetation, even why our grass is nice, dark, healthy green, and there's pale yellow. This picture shows a local vineyard that I work with and the owner who came and purchased some compost tea from us a couple of years ago, just north of the highway, before I taught them how to make their own compost and compost tea. The picture on the left, shows the vine rows after tea was applied. The green is a good, dark, healthy green. The vines were sprayed at the same time, just after pruning, so the trunks and the cordons got a good soaking with fungal-dominated compost tea. The picture on the right shows the headland at the end of the rows. This was not sprayed, and the cape weed is obvious. Also, the poor grass cover and the poor color of the grass. Soil samples were taken before and after the application of the compost tea. There was a significant difference in the fungal to bacterial ratios and in the population of protozoa and mycorrhizal fungi in the sprayed areas compared with the headland. But more noticeably was the lack of cape weed in the sprayed areas. The viticulturist was delighted. He had three weeks more synthetic leaves on his vines after he sprayed for two years. The vines were definitely more, the wines were definitely more vibrant. And that was proven with the trophies the winery won a couple of years later. But back to our farm. No synthetic chemistry on our farm. Our input costs are our time. We do not have pathogens in our vegetables because the sugar levels are too high. We grow mixed species in our pastures and in our vegetable gardens. We respect the power of the microbial world in our soil. We farm our soil. Overuse of agrochemicals disrupt nutrient transfer. They degrade and disable plant defenses, opening opportunities for pathogens to attack vulnerable plants. By unintentionally destroying beneficial soil biota, we disrupt the nutritional and defense systems that plants have perfected through the adaptive symbiosis with microbial populations. We are making pathogens from otherwise useful microbes. Pathogens are of our making. New and innovative chemicals will not help. Remove the synthetic chemicals and return to organic systems. There is not a shortage of food in the world. There is a problem with quality, nutritional value, distribution, and waste. We do not need more land to grow food to feed the world's population. We need to use our already available land better. Look at the fungal kingdom as a friend. It's amazing like device and fascinating. If you spend some time to understand it and work with it, I've been working with the fungal kingdom for 40 years, 47 years, longer, and I'm still in awe. So I conclude that I've proven pathogens are of our making. Thank you. Mm -hmm.